So let's do a run through of the pathophysiology behind bronchiolitis. So as with a common cold, this starts with the entry of a pathogen into the upper respiratory tract. So as we know, RSV is responsible for a large part of the bronchiolitis that we deal with every winter. But it can also be caused by adenovirus, rhinovirus, many other viruses, including coronavirus. So what happens once it enters the respiratory tract, you're going to get some local inflammation. You're going to get um, the goblet cells increasing production of mucus and start to get those cold symptoms, that congestion, the snotty nose. The replication then starts to move down those airways and the support mechanisms to prevent that happening is within your epithelium and your cilia, which are actually trying to brush the virus trying to fight it and brush it up towards the nose and out again and prevent it from tracking down. But we can't always prevent it. Sometimes that will track down and that will also depend on how good the, the um, immune response is for the baby. So clinical findings at this stage are really looking at uh, cold type symptoms. Um, so sort of chorizal with or without a cough, um, perhaps feeling a bit of a sore throat. You might get some mild tachypnea and dyspnea um, and certainly some reduction in feeding, although it, they may also try to increase feeding to increase their um, fluid intake. Uh, so you may see some nasal flaring, if it's particularly if it's an underweight um, baby or a sort of ex-premature baby. But at this point in time, they're either going to start to get better over one to three days or things are going to progress down the respiratory tract, the lower respiratory tract. So at this point, once it moves down the respiratory tract, the lower airways, you get an inflammatory response, a local inflammatory response. And if we look at this cross-sectional part of the airway, then you can see the one of the first things that happens is the submucosal edema. So that inflammatory response, we know we get leaky vessels and lots of inflammatory um, cascade that happens that results in that edema. And this also happens locally in the airways. You also get that increased production of mucus from the goblet cells. So already you can see a narrowing of this airway. Now for babies that already have a narrow airway in comparison to adults, this causes a lot of resistance in the airways. So on top of that, we also have some necrosis starting to happen on your epithelium. So some of these epithelial cells will necrose and start to slough off. As they slough off, they start to sort of form together with the mucus and start to cause more resistance in the airway. And you can see the difference that's been made there by the mucosal edema, the mucus and the epithelial sloughing off. And that has caused a lot of resistance in that airway. So as we look at this trajectory of air down through the airway, you can see that narrowing from a sideways view and how much resistance that could cause for the movement of air within that airway. Now, remember the airway resistance that we're going to meet there is going to make some kind of musical noises. And that's why we hear that wheeze in bronchiolitis that makes us reach for the nebulizers and want desperately to treat it as we would asthma. But this is why it's not going to work because it's a different source of the problem. The wheeze isn't, isn't, um, hasn't come about in the exact same way as it does within asthma. So let's have a look, little bit of a look down the sort of bronchial tree as to what that would look down here, like down here. And we can see that thickening down the small bronchi and the bronchioles, and then that increased mucus production. And you can see that we've got that thinning of the airways, and then that epithelial cells, necrotic, sloughing off, and starting to form with the mucus to create a kind of mucus plug. So at this point, we're looking at some aero narrowing, which we've very clearly seen now on all three of those images. So the narrowing becomes worse and we start to get a lot of resistance down the airway. So the, the air is going to travel down the path of least resistance. But if it does try to get down 
these bronch bronchioles, then we're going to down into the alveoli here that are past the plugging. Then what we're going to get is um, some airflow coming through at first because it's like a one way valve. But unfortunately, what you get is that it's it can't actually get out. So what happens is the air starts coming through into the alveoli. No way of escape through that one way valve and you start to get that airway trapping. And that's why we get airway trapping within bronchiolitis. So as that alveolus starts to expand, you get to the point where it's completely plugged off and there is nowhere to escape. That air will eventually be reabsorbed. And once the air can't enter the alveoli anymore, it will collapse down. And that's where we're going to get some atelectasis. So this is why you get airway um airway trapping and atelectasis in bronchiolitis and then you can see that the, that the air will then follow that path of least resistance and um, we'll, we'll have more pressure going to the healthy alveoli which may form more air trapping. So the symptoms that we're going to see at this point is obviously that in, as the trajectory of the illness goes on, if you've not seen it already, then definitely some nasal flaring, increasing that cough, increasing tachypnea, increasing dyspnea. We're going to start to see use of accessory muscles such as the sternocleidomastoid, which is going to cause that head bopping that we see in children and in, in particularly in babies. You're going to see intercostal muscle use and subcostal recession. You're going to start to see some sort of abdominal movements where the abdo abdomen is being used to support the respiratory status. And then we're going to start to perhaps see some seesaw breathing with that. You're also going to see subcostal intercostal recession. And you may also see some tracheal tug later on and perhaps hear some grunting if this does advance to a serious illness. Obviously, increased temperature with the virus. We're going to see increased heart rate going to start to see a drop in sats once we have that mismatch in perfusion and ventilation and because of the reduced um, feeding and fluid and the work of breathing that's going in to supply oxygen to the body we're going to see lethargy dehydration decrease urine output at some point also for the infants we may see a drop in respiratory rate at this point and we need to be very aware of the risk of apneas particularly in those small babies <laughs> 